The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hello and welcome to Health for a Lifetime. I'm your host, Don McIntosh, and today we're going to talk about an unusual topic, but something that many people struggle with, and that's fungus. And talking with us today about fungus is Dr. David DeRose. He has started a ministry called Compass Health, uh, compasshealth.net. And Dr. DeRose, you're a specialist in internal medicine and uh, preventive medicine. You've got a master's in public health. This is kind of a blending of both the medical and the ministry uh, in Compass Health, isn't that right? That's exactly right. And uh, basically, we do things for churches, community groups. We do things for the general public as far as materials that we write. Uh, we have some videos out, a uh, book, a number of things that really can put more practical health information in people's hands, as well as the media things that we do in radio and TV. Um, and you work together as a family, and this is kind of a family thing as well. Well, some of it is. I mean, of course, a lot of the technical work uh, I'm doing. My wife is also a physician, but uh, she's a busy uh, homeschooling mother as well mm -hmm. and uh, trying to run the house, keep me in line, as well as uh, three children. <laughs> uh, it doesn't give her much time to do the medical end of things in uh, Compass Health. She has a large corpus callosum. She has to keep all those That's things right. together. That's right. Okay, let's talk then about... Uh, fungus today. And it's, uh, what is a fungus and uh, do a lot of people struggle with problems with fungus? Well, there's no question. I mean, fungus uh, or yeast uh, is actually a form of uh, infectious condition. These are infectious, uh, potentially infectious organisms, if you will. Uh, they're different than viruses or bacteria, and uh, they can cause human illness and disease. Uh, the most common uh, things that we see in most uh, general practices are skin fungus infections, but there are a whole host of fungus infections that can affect the lungs and other parts of the body and can be very serious and even life-threatening. Candida? Is it Can a fungus? Candida, uh, sometimes are called candida, other times candida, but uh, it's one of them, histoplasmosis. Uh, coccidiomycosis, blastomycosis, I mean a lot of things that mucormycosis, <laughs> you know, and people's eyes are already glazing over, <laughs> you know, for <laughs> well, today's these are all show. just names for fungus. These are different types of fungus. Different uh, places. Some of those are very bad fungus infections that are systemic, and then these other funguses that we call dermatophytes, they're funguses of the that skin. reside on the skin and cause skin problems. So the causes, what causes a fungus? I, I'm sure it depends on where it is, but uh, some general causes. Well, the general perspective, at least on these skin fungus infections, is that these fungi, fungi are ubiquitous. They're all over. Uh, different host factors, whether it's genetic things, whether it's lifestyle things, predispose certain people to get skin fungal infections. We know certain environmental factors have a role. Mm -hmm. For example, if your skin is broken down, okay. it's more susceptible to a fungal infection. And fungi in general, Don, do best in warm, moist environments. So warm, moist conditions, um, that can cause a, just a proliferation of this. It can cause a proliferation. It really, it really sets the stage, if you will, for an ideal environment for these organisms. We're seeing this more and more in our country because people are providing. They're literally, it's like they're building houses for fungi. Have you ever thought about this? <laughs> no, and I don't think that, that that's what they set out to do, but what do you mean? Well, as we gain weight, okay, and we get these skin folds, especially if we gain lots of weight, mm. what happens is those skin folds tend to be moist, warm areas, and people will often get what um. we call an intertriginous in within the between the skin layers dermatitis an infection with these fungi oftentimes mm. uh, these dermatophytes and so they get this fungal rash mm. uh, under the you know their their abdominal fat or in other 
fatty areas of the body. So this is something really that's becoming a big, big problem in our country as we're gaining weight and becoming larger. What about uh, you know having a depressed immune system? This is, this is important too, Don. People that have diabetes, uh, people that have immune system impairment, they are more predisposed to these infections. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if, you've got, if you're a diabetic, how does, that, how does that really work? Well, actually, blood sugar, uh, we've, we've known this for years, is something that actually interferes with normal immune system processes. Um, it's actually not just in diabetes. I mean, many of our, our viewers have probably heard of studies that were done many years ago where people ate simple sugars. Mm -hmm. uh, the classic studies, you know, with, with just plain sugar, but they've done this with, uh, with juice and honey and other things. You raise the blood sugar quickly, and that actually interferes with the ability of the white blood cells to fight microorganisms. So whatever is happening with blood sugar is likely part of the connection with diabetes and why diabetes has uh, immune suppressing effects. We also know that those high blood sugars complex, they join up with important proteins in the body and this probably also plays a role especially in uncontrolled diabetes. So depression of the immune system comes as a result of the elevating sugars but I've also heard that when someone is obese or someone is overweight they're, they're in a state of infection, is that right or wrong? Well it's an inflammatory condition okay. if you will. The, uh, what happens is as we gain weight, especially around the middle Mm -hmm. this visceral fat, this fat around the organs, it actually uh, stimulates some inflammatory hormones in the body that do have a number of deleterious processes. It seems like this is some of what drives uh, insulin resistance, some mm -hmm. of these uh, metabolic products that are uh, actually uh, inflammatory chemicals. So uh, diabetes, these other things, if you have them, they certainly can set you up for fungal infections as well. What about Cushing syndrome. Well, Cushing syndrome is another basically hormonal condition, and uh, oftentimes people with Cushing's will have excess weight, so they have those those skin fold problems. They have the disordered blood sugar. So we could go through a whole list of examples like this: uh, HIV infection. Uh, we could talk about people who've had transplants, you know, kidney transplant, liver transplant. These people are taking anti-rejection drugs mm. that are suppressing their immune system. So the common denominator that we have here, Don, are these host factors. Whether it's a drug you're taking, whether it's a disease that's increasing the risk. So we've got the host factors that increase the risk for fungal infections, and then we've got the environmental factors. Okay? One of the things that people often don't think about when it comes to the environmental factors is the clothes they wear. Mm like uh, clothes that cause moisture and all those that That's stuff. That's right. Nylon, for example, holds in moisture. Mm -hmm. Cotton is the best type of clothing to wear. If you've got uh, uh, an athlete's foot, okay? Athlete's cotton foot, socks. Wear cotton socks. Wear more breathable shoes. I mean, if you can wear sandals, or if you, can, if you don't have to wear socks mm -hmm. in the summertime, wear the sandals and, and go without the socks. If you're try what you want to do is you want to get it cool, cooler at least, dry, mm -hmm. and more air circulating. These are the themes mm -hmm. that we want to keep in mind when you're trying to suppress these fungal infections or remove the possibility for them arising. Okay. Are there genetic factors that drive uh, fungal infections? There seem to be genetic factors, and uh, I'm going to you know, be honest with you. I'm not an expert in the, in the genetics of, uh, of host factors when it comes to fungal infection, but there definitely seems to be some predispositions host-wise as far as the individual, whether it has to do with skin quality, uh, whether it has to do with skin oil production. There's a variety of things that theoretically may be impacting how well a person can fend off these organisms that are all around us. You have something written down here, atopy, A-T-O-P-Y. Okay. Uh, that refers to atopic conditions. These are allergic conditions. Okay. Um, skin is often affected in this, like young children many mm -hmm. times have an atopic uh, problem. And they may get facial rashes or other things. There may be some food relationships. The bottom line, if you've got an allergic condition that has skin manifestations, mm -hmm. that is 
lowering the resistance of the skin to other problems. Mm. And so these fungi can then get in and cause a fungus infection. Well, if someone has a question, normally they'd see their general physician and maybe a dermatologist for some of these Exactly. Things. If you know it's a fungus infection or it's, it's just related to the skin, dermatologists, I mean, they're the experts when it comes to these skin infections. Many general practitioners will have a lot of experience dealing with some of the more simple uh, things that occur frequently because they just see it so often. So we're going to look at some practical ways to kind of uh, uh, treat these things. Are we ready exactly. to move there or is there anything else we need to understand? No, I think, I think that's where we want to go, Don, because we want to make the program practical. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's look at some of those practical things. Work us through some things that we can do. Okay. Because these fungal infections can affect all different parts of the body, uh, one of the common ones is the athlete's foot. We've mentioned it already. Let's talk about that first of all. Let's do it. Strategies again. Remember, the environment, you want to keep it cool, you want to keep it dry. We've talked about the clothing, we've talked about something that may have just passed by people, and that is when it comes to moisture content, they may have read between the lines, but where is the most common place that you're exposed to moisture when it comes to your feet? Probably in the shower, sometimes a collective shower, maybe where all the other athletes have taken a shower. <laughs> okay, <laughs> is you're that, right. Is that where you pick it up? Is well, it contagious? Yes, there is, there is evidence that people who are using communal uh, bath facilities like athletes uh, are at higher risk of these things. Uh, my mother really wanted me to be a sissy when I was a boy, you know that. No, I didn't know that, but... Because uh, she didn't succeed, hopefully, is what right. you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but what she wanted me to do is when I was a kid, high school kid, she wanted me to wear thongs, you know, uh, sandals in the shower room. You because know, of this athlete's foot. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to do that. And so you got athlete's foot. Did I tell you this already? No, but I can almost I guess. I did. And then I started wearing the thongs so I wouldn't give it to anyone else, whether mm -hmm. that helped or not. But... You see the point? Mm -hmm. That community, mom knew best again. Mm -hmm. I should have listened to her. Mm -hmm. But this is an important risk factor. But here's the other point. We're talking about treatment now. You've mm -hmm. got the athlete's foot already. What do you do when you come out of the shower? You dry your feet off. You make them, or you open them up to air. You put sandals on maybe. I don't but know. But how do you dry your feet? That, this is the question. With a lot a of people, towel. Well, you know what? Often people dry the area that's affected by the fungus incorrectly. If they've got it with affecting their feet, under a layer of fat in their abdomen, if it's in their private area, in the, around their bottom, these are all common places, okay, to have these fungal infections. And people, they say, I've got to keep it dry, so they go ahead and they get that terry towel and they dry between their toes or they, you know, dry in some other areas. That's wrong. It's wrong because the skin, when it's moist, is very susceptible to physical agitation or physical irritation. So what you do... Dab it, it. That's right. You blot it dry. To get it really, really well dry, use a blow dryer mm. on a low heat setting. Okay? okay? Spread your toes apart. Use the blow dryer after you've blotted it dry. Just kind of pat on top of the feet or under the other areas that, uh, that you're treating and then get it really dry before you put the clothing on. I mean... If you didn't listen to your mother about the thongs, there's not going to be too many people <laughs> listening about the blow dryer, but, but that still is good advice. Yeah, it is good advice, and my mom's advice was good. <laughs> so uh, we've got to give all the wisdom that's out there because, you know what, most people don't get motivated to prevent something. They get motivated to treat it. That was the case for me. Aside from drying it off, aside from doing all the things you said that are natural things, are there any medications that you need for there athlete's are. foot? I mean, there are medications. Many people have used uh, the ointments, the lotions, the over-the-counter things, and those things are fine. They're often effective. The problem is most people don't use them long enough. Is there anything we can do to, uh, you know, lots of times it's the itch cycle or something like that that you've noted on your web page here. What... Uh, Talk to us about the itch cycle okay. and disrupting it. Yeah, there, there's what we sometimes call the scratch itch cycle. And, you know, I can tell you, Don, listen, we're on the air. Uh, maybe your mom told you this. Don't scratch yourself, okay? People are watching you. Uh, so, you know, during, <laughs> really, during the public times of our, during the waking hours, mm -hmm. we can say, even if we're not, no one's watching us, we're going to say, look, if the doctor told me if I scratch this area, it's just making it worse because I'm disturbing the skin integrity and it's making things worse. What happens at night? What happens when you're sleeping and you've got an area that itches? What do you think you do? You scratch it. You scratch it. You don't have any higher cortical control while you're asleep. Right. So it is important many times if the skin is being disturbed to break that scratch itch cycle. 
Mm -hmm. Now, many of these antifungal preparations, medications, medications, that's right, will have something for the itch in it as well. A classic one will be some hydrocortisone. Okay. Now, this is ironic because cortisone drugs actually suppress the immune system. Mm. So they're not good over the long haul. Yeah, they're not good over the long haul. They also, the more potent ones, can, skin, uh, can uh, thin the skin. Mm, not good because that it makes it easier to be uh, introducing secondary pathogens, perhaps. That's right, that's right. So really, although these are sometimes included and we can get away with it sometimes, some people, if they have a real resistant fungal infection, using these common preparations that have the steroids in them will only frustrate the problem. We're talking with Dr. David DeRose. We're talking about fungal infections and uh, other things that can afflict us uh, in America with our skin and whatnot. Join us when we come back. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Lettington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally, and we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who are able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Ludington have been featured on 3ABM, and in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. Call or write today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge. So call or write today. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. David DeRose. We've been talking about fungal infections, and uh, much of the information that we cover today is going to be covered more in depth on Dr. DeRose's webpage, uh, which is called compasshealth.net. And uh, thank you, by the way, for you know providing that uh, expansion on what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about fungal infections, and you've noticed several things, uh, some basic things. Avoiding the moist conditions, communal baths, uh, immunosuppression, and then, you know, some uh, more specific conditions that can lead to this, like Cushing syndrome or HIV or these other things that break down the, uh, the ability of the body to fight against these things. You've talked about atopy. You've talked about genetic predispositions. And we started to talk about treatments. Question comes to mind though, is are fungal infections the same as eczema? Is there a difference? Oh no, very different. Yeah, eczema is not a fungal infection, but eczema is related in that, like the scenario we were talking about earlier, any type of skin infection or skin problem, any type of skin problem can lower the resistance of that skin to fungal infection. Eczema actually uh, has some seasonal variations. I mean, people, uh, when the air is colder and drier, uh, containing less moisture, people that are predisposed to eczema will often have more problems. Mm -hmm. uh, doctors and nurses, uh, we're at high risk. Washing our hands eczema, all the time. Yeah, washing our hands so frequently, often get a hand eczema. So the idea is uh, to moisturize as well as washing the skin and uh, you know, use a good moisturizer as well a after you wash. Now, the, the reason it came to my mind is because one of the treatments you were suggesting for a fungal infection is something that sometimes they use with eczema, that being a cortis cortisone kind of base cream. Exactly. The cortisone does not actually treat the fungus, okay? So just to use a cortisone cream on a fungal infection Doesn't will actually work. tend to make it worse. I see. Okay? So what, what they often try to get away with doing, and I, you know, I'm more of a purist. Um, I, I, I like... I sensed that. Yeah, you did? You did. <laughs> I, I like to treat the problem. Mm -hmm. So I tend not to use the cortisone-containing preparations initially, but uh, many of my colleagues will say, well, look at DeRose, get off the, uh, you know, the purist kick and uh, just be you know, realistic. You can give a little cortisone mixed in with these things. There are many commercial preparations. And like I said, many people can get away with using these, but others don't. And they've got to drop the cortisone out of the preparation and then use something else for the itching, Don, mm -hmm. whether it's an antihistamine orally, whether it's something topical. Um, I'll tell you an interesting thing. A lot of people uh, don't know this, but uh, calamine lotion, mm -hmm. you know, people think of using that for uh, poison ivy. Well, it's a drying lotion. So you can use it for a fungal problem. You could actually use it. If the fungal infection, it's not a treatment for fungus, 
But if you've been treated, if you've got like a chronic fungal infection, a chronic athlete's foot problem, you don't want to take one of the oral antifungal medications because you're afraid of the side effects, and there are some reasons to be afraid. Some of these are very potent uh, drugs that can cause liver irritation and other things. And you say, look at, um, I just want to keep the area very clean, dry, cool. Uh, the calamine lotion or a caladrill that includes mm -hmm. Benadryl with an anti-itching compound may actually help. If you can break the cycle sometimes uh, with that itching, sometimes that in and of itself will allow it to heal, and that may be what was perpetuating it. So just like an athlete's foot, you said to you know, dry it by blotting or daubing rather than you know, irritating it because that's kind of almost like an itch cycle. So exactly. if you had things in other places, your private areas, you do the same kind of thing, keep it dry, um, water and and then dry. Well, the, the private areas are, are really difficult, uh, difficult areas to handle sometimes. And there's several reasons for that. Um, one of them is uh, there's the microbiologic environment there is different. Um, you know, especially if you think of, you know, where the colon empties out. Um, you know, we're continually exposing that area to some of the uh, byproducts of our, our digestive system. And uh, some of the strategies that seem to make a difference in people that have problems in those areas is uh, actually looking very closely at their diet, avoiding lots of simple sugars. The mm -hmm. theory behind that is we're going to provide less food for the yeast mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that thrive on those simple sugars in that environment. Uh, another strategy that's sometimes used is probiotics. These so-called good bacteria like lactobacillus, these can be taken orally mm -hmm. and there are some suggestions that this may help to address uh, some of the problems that the, we may have in the rectal area or other areas. So there, you know, we're talking about two different kind of things, things that stop the itching cycle and all that, but then the actual treatment of the fungus, what should people take for that? It's not just going to sometimes go away on its own. No, actually, many times you do need something. There are some natural strategies that work, and it depends where the fungal infection is, whether or not you use these. Um, garlic has antifungal properties, for example. Hmm. Uh, some people have had success using garlic powder. Now, it's not something that I've actually used. The, the, the natural things that I tend to use uh, first are uh, tea tree oil. Tea tree oil. You That's have this right. on the web page. That's right. Well. It's on the, on the web page. Right. Tea tree oil. Mm -hmm. um, this has natural antifungal properties. Have to be careful with it though because there is a significant percentage of people that do get allergic to the tea tree oil. So okay. you need to be, uh, be If that be doesn't work, what's your second line? Um, well, not necessarily the second line, but uh, another one that, uh, that actually can be effective is, uh, is vinegar. Vinegar, vinegar actually has uh, antifungal properties. And then garlic powder? Garlic powder, calendula is another herb. Calendula, what's that? Yeah, calendula is an herb okay. that has some antifungal uh, properties. So there's a number of these uh, herbs and natural products that can be used for people that gravitate in that direction. And then there are some of the uh, over-the-counter, you don't need a prescription, antifungals, you know, your lotrimins and monostat and mycostat and things like this uh, that can be used on fungal areas, usually they work quite good. The mm -hmm. tenactin powders, things like this, uh, many, many times they do, do work well. And then there's a whole probably class of drugs or regimens that you can only get from your doctor, your dermatologist, your general practice person. Yeah, especially if uh, you know, you've got a resistant fungal infection and it's going to require something orally. Some of these drugs, uh, uh, you know, they're prescription drugs, they can be very expensive, they need to be monitored, and some of them do have significant uh, toxicities. Yeah, you make a difference on the webpage between topical antifungal preparations and systemic drugs. That's, and I appreciate you highlighting that because sometimes, you know, the terminology we use in professional circles is, is not familiar to lay people. Topical is what you put on the skin. Mm -hmm. and, and generally these topical things are, are readily available, many options at least, over the counter. The thing is, Don, though, while we're talking about the topical, I'll mention the systemic uh, again. That's the, like the oral things you take that go mm -hmm. throughout the body. But make sure, people need to make sure that they treat these things, usually what we'll say is a minimum, sometimes of two weeks. Mm. And make sure you continue the treatment for a week after the infection is cleared. Th that's one rule of thumb for going so about So it's like this. an antibiotic. Yeah. A lot of people will treat it, they'll knock it out, and uh, what they've really done is they've allowed, at least theoretically, that fungus, that yeast, to become resistant to whatever, because they knocked it down 
enough, but they didn't wipe it out. So make sure you use it for a week uh, after you've uh, eradicated the, you know, at least visibly eradicated it. You have some specifics here in applying vinegar and whatnot, a kind of a formula, um, one half calendula, one half ounce of myrrh, one half quart vinegar, and you have like these there on the web page as well for actual treatments if you're going that natural way. That's right. Uh, myrrh is another uh, agent that's been used in these preparations like you point out. So there are recipes uh, that have been used of more natural combinations and that's one of them. Fungus under the nails? Fungus under the nails or nail fungus. It's really a, a fungus that actually infects the nail itself. Um, those can be very resistant, especially the toenails. Um, there is data, research data, done in the medical research literature showing that tea tree oil um, in a percentage of people is an effective treatment. Now, it's, when I say effective treatment, we're not talking uh, 50, 60, 70 percent. It's, it's a minority of people, but if someone wants to go with a natural treatment, you're talking three to six months, whatever you do. If you're doing something topical on the toenails, they're slow to grow, and you need to be committed to the long haul for applying this, uh, this treatment topically. Garlic? Garlic, like we said, it does have these antifungal properties. The problem with garlic uh, is it is an irritant as well. So is the vinegar. You've got to be careful. If the skin's very raw, um, you're not going to want to put vinegar on it. It's not going to be uh, uh, necessarily going to win you any popularity contests if you, exactly. you know, uh, at least me, because I'm the one talking about it here on the air. <laughs> right. Um, you know, as always, the, these suggestions are helpful, and there's a lot more that could be talked about, and there's some of this on the webpage, compasshealth.net. But you're a Christian clinician, and, and uh, I want to hear a spiritual, uh, hopeful thought, perhaps, that, that we can share as we're closing out this segment. Well, you know, we've been talking today, Don, about two strategies, treating a problem before it, uh, well, treating a problem once you have it, and then preventing it from ever occurring. Mm -hmm. You know, and I find that the Lord is so wonderful at doing that in the scriptures. He both provides treatments for our need, our point of need. He offers us the help that we need. We can come to Him with our health problems, our spiritual problems, but He also has a preventive program. Mm -hmm. And I, I really see as a physician, His Word often is a textbook on public health, preventive mm -hmm. medicine. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeRose, for joining us. And thank you also for, for putting the material together on the website, compasshealth.net, and for, for the ministry of actually service. I mean, uh, seminars and, and, and working with people, making this material accessible to the public. We're just glad we can do it. And thank you for joining us on Health for a Lifetime. Today's program has been very practical, and uh, I hope that it has immediate use for you. If you need more information, of course, visit those resources. And thanks for joining us.